All right, welcome everyone. So today we're going to talk about another part, or actually the final part in the graphics pipeline, not the final part in general, but the final part for, for this course. So uh, we already talked about the, we started with the graphics pipeline by talking about the perspective projection. And then last week, uh, last time, I finished up or I talked about two exceptions that we made. The one was that we're now able also to deal with triangles that are completely or partly outside of the view frustum by doing clipping. And also we're able to do uh, to deal with the, f um, with the situation where triangles are overlapping by drawing them in a the right order using, for example, the set buffer. And the last thing that we have on our list that we want to talk about is the shading, that is the putting the actual color on the triangles, considering, for example, also light conditions. And of course, we have already done this. We have already talked about texture mapping, for example, which is a different way, a, kind, a special kind of shading in one way. But generally, when we talk about shading, we think about like calculating light influences and things like that. And we already had that at the beginning where we had this simplified shading model, which was something that, of course, you used in the, uh, uh, you needed that, of course, for the practicals. And of course, it was a nice introduction at the beginning. And today, we're basically just finishing up some loose ends. And I'm going to do a lot of repetition there, but also uh, mention a couple of things that at that time uh, I didn't mention because we are, we were not, uh, just didn't have all the, the mathematical background and the background knowledge that uh, it made sense to talk about it at that time. Good. So uh, the first thing that we haven't talked about yet, we talked about how to bring and project those 3D, uh, those abstract 3D representations onto the 2D screen and not just projecting them from, 2D, uh, from 3D to 2D, but really how to directly calculate the concrete pixels that we have on a certain screen or on a certain window in our screen. And when we enlarge the window, of course, we have to recalculate it. So we talked about that, but we still talked only about the vertices of a triangle. And of course, we also have to, uh, of course, that's that's usually enough that you need, of course, in, in, a, in a program, you just call your function that, for example, draw a triangle or draw a line and you give it just the vertices and then the computer does it. But of course, we want to know, want to understand what is behind those functions, what is going on, how can we really calculate the pixels that we really have to draw when we want to draw a triangle that is now specified by three vertices on a 2D, on our 2D screen. So this process of rasterization, of course, we, we know how this works. We can we have all the mathematics available, we can calculate it. For example, we can easily check if a pixel, if we specify the edges of a triangle with normals that point outside, then we can, uh, can of course, do an easy check like we saw last time uh, on which side of a triangle a pixel is. And if it is, of course, on the inside of all the three vertices, then, of course, it is part of the triangle and we could, can put some color on the pixel. But, of course, if we do this for all the pixels and all the triangles, that would be something that is very, very inefficient. So the most, probably one of the most simple uh, approaches to deal with this is uh, just using a bounding box instead of checking and only check the, peep, uh, the pixels within that bounding box. Um, you remember last time we had a similar uh, uh, situation where we said we have triangles that are outside of the view frustum and we want to eliminate those that are not intersecting or inside of the view fr intersecting with the view frustum or inside of it. And then we said we use a volume that a bounding volume around certain objects to che to check if the volume intersects and if the volume doesn't intersect, then of course all the objects or triangles within are not intersecting. So we don't have to test each of them. And this is a similar idea. Of course, here we are not using a volume. We used the volume because it was very easy to calculate if the vol uh, to check if the volume intersects with the few frustum. If we have a, sp um, <laughs> I said volume. I meant we used a sphere last time as a bounding volume because it was easy to check with a sphere. Now here for a triangle, of course, we're in 2D now, and of course the bounding box, which is the smallest box that is parallel to the axis, so to the sides of our screen or our viewing window, that uh, the smallest uh, pa uh, axis parallel uh, uh, rectangle that contains the object, which is, um, of course, because we have this uh, rectangular shape of the window now is very easy to calculate and very easy to get. Because, of course, if you look at the x axis, at the x value, then, of course, the left one, leftmost one 
is the minimum x value that you have and the rightmost one is the maximum x value that you have. Same for the y values. The lowest is y min if of course we own if and only if we have the origin at this position here of course at the lower left like we usually do here at least in the course not necessarily in an API. So these are the max and min and of course from the image we see immediately that we can use these minimum values to create a lower left point of the uh, rectangle that is our bounding box and the maximums to create the upper right point which contains these two max values but of course is a new point it's not a point of the triangle and this way we have here this rectangular bounding box very easily created and of course we can not only see it very easily but this is something we can also very easily implement of course and this is of course why this is uh, kind of quite often used but it is a very simple approach of course that doesn't that helps us a lot but doesn't really work that perfect all the time especially if we have objects like this here then we can, then we can have a lot of empty space and you know that uh, we talked last time about it when we talked about the the culling with the few frustum that this was a conservative test that means we do a test and then we we're basically trying to be on the safe side so we rather make a lot of uh, tests that go wrong instead of uh, uh, and, and in the end are sure that we have a correct result but of course we would like to avoid this we would like to have a more efficient way to do it and this is uh, done with uh, or can be done one approach is a so-called scanline algorithms which is not <clears throat> which are not in the book uh, but the book explains triangle rasterization in a little a different way but if you read the book and compare it to the scanline algorithm that I'm explaining here, then you will see that the basic idea behind it is actually pretty much the same. Good. So, yeah, the scanline algorithm has, of course, the advantage that it doesn't only work for triangles, but it works also for random polygons that we have here in 2D. So let's look at this example here. <coughs> um, of course, but before we do that, um, You've already probably realized that when I was drawing this here, I, when I draw the polygon, also when I made the notes x min and x max, I was always drawing here in the center of our grid, whereas usually when we calculate with coordinate systems, we're at the vertices of our grid. Um, but that is, of course, because we're dealing now with the pixels on the screen. So where we say the pixels, pixel is actually in the center of a cell, which is why when we did the windowing transformation, we just added minus one half to it which is something i would not like to do here because it just makes the writing so much more annoying and more complicated also so what i'm just saying we're just shifting our coordinate system and just assume that we are at the corners of our grid now so we can calculate with full integer values just be careful when you uh, think about it. of course for concrete implementation you have to to uh, consider that good yeah so i already said it the algorithm we are going to use is a so-called scanline algorithm scanline algorithms are very uh popular or very often used in geometric uh, uh when you study geometric algorithms um because the uh the idea of a scanline algorithm is that you have a line that well as the name suggests scans over a scene and does some processing on that scene while it scans over it and the idea of it is that uh, it is often applied in situations where we can make all the processing at one position of the scan line only depending, uh, where all processing at one position of the scan line only depends on the processing that we have done before. So, for example, if we have a scene like this here, and we have a scan line that moves from the left to the right, then we do processing at this position here and then we move to the next position to the processing at this position of the scan line for all the values that are here intersecting with the scan line and this processing that we do here only depends on what we have seen so far it doesn't depend on what we haven't seen yet and that of course means we only have to do one run over it so based on the scan line we only have a linear runtime behavior which is of course very very good and uh, of course you already see it here from the image you can guess I draw it from left to right now but of course here in the image we have a scan line we use a scan line that is vertical uh, sorry horizontal and we move it from the bottom to the top and we want to draw now uh, to decide now which of the pixels in this that are intersecting with this scan line at this level on the y-axis 
are the ones that are part of the polygon net that we have to draw. And the second phrase that you see here is called coherence, it, it is uh, uh, named coherence. It says here we are taking advantage of scanline coherence. So the scanline uh, principle I already explained, but coherence basically means that it, it is a phrase that is often used in, in algorithms every time you're, you're taking advantage of a certain structure that you have in the data. And we will see now when we do this with the polygons, we will see a good example for it, where we can take advantage of additional knowledge that we have about the data to make our calculation easier. So uh, <clears throat> let's start with a, with a simple example. We're looking at the scan line number three. And there we see, of course, we have here, it intersects with two edges of the polygon, this one, the left one, and the right one. And we call these active edges because they are actively intersecting with the scan line at this position. And if we have these edges, of course, we can calculate the intersection points. And then we just have to here round up or here round down. And then we know that all the points in between are, of course, the points that are within this closed polygon, of course, we have to have a closed polygon if we have something like that. And to the scan line, of course, then it doesn't, uh, we have the problem here that we, if you just look at the first one, then it looks like this is, of course, uh, 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 that this is the inside, although it is actually the outside. So we have to have, that doesn't work, so. But if we have a situation like this, then of course it's clear if we have the left and the right uh, border or here, if we have four active edges, then we have here an intersection point where we go in, here we go out, here we go in, here we go out, and then we know we have to draw these in between. And this is already some sort of coherence that we're using. We're using this knowledge that we have that when we have a closed polygon that uh, the uh, the inside between two intersection points are all points that are inside the polygon, so we have to draw them. So we just have to calculate the intersection points. We don't have to calculate the points, uh, do calculations for the points in between. Good, and of course, how to do this uh, intersection is quite easy. In this case, I'm using here the slope intercept equation, which we haven't very used very much, um, but in this situation, it makes the calculation quite simple. And it's, of course, another example where uh, it all comes into play. Like at the beginning, I'm always saying, yeah, uh, we have these different representations for these objects, for, for lines. We have the parametric implicit uh, slope intercept. And of course, I'm pretty sure a lot of you are wondering why is he bringing up another representation of it? I mean, uh, why, why do we need all these different ways to express the very same thing? But you see now there are a lot of examples where I'm just using a special kind of representation and then you see that the problem can be solved very easily if you represent it that way. And this is the case here. If we use the slope intercept form, we can represent the line in the following way that we say, of course, the slope intercept is the distance here on the y-axis, so that is minus 2.5. And the slope is any distance in the y-axis divided by the same distance we have to go uh, on the x-axis that we have divided by, no. <laughs> the distance on the y-axis that we have to go divided by the distance on the x-axis. So this relative uh, uh, si size here, when we divide it, is then our defines our slope and it doesn't really matter which we're taking usually we we look into what happens when we go one step to the right how far do we have to go up or go down to get our slope so we know if we go one step to the right and two up of course then it's a slope of two for example but we can take any two because of course if the one increases the other increases uh, uh, with the same relative uh, size so we always get the same slope here and this and this is why we're often uh, calling these here these uh, is a delta y and a delta x because it is, of course, a difference between these two, the x and the y val the y values, the no, the difference on the y of the y coordinate and the x coordinate of these two points here, and then divided by each other. And if you look at the image, then you see here, of course, that this is 3.5 in this case here. And then, of course, we can calculate the intersection point here, and then we know that this intersection, and when you see the intersection point is 1 4 sevenths, that means we have to start drawing the pixels at the x value of 2 and the y value of 3 till we reach this other intersection point here. So, of course, this is very uh, simple, but we want to do this also. Oh, yeah, this is actually a nicer representation of it. Um, 
And um, so we can do this very easily, but of course we also want to do it efficiently because we want to do this for a lot of, for hundreds or thousands of polygons or triangles. And uh, this is now where the uh, so-called vertical coherence comes into play, where we take advantage of the data that we already calculated before in the previous step of the scan line when we were, for example, with the scan line at position number two. And this vertical coherence, you see the relation here. If you think about what happens when I move from one point, intersection point here, further along the line till I get to the next, inter to the intersection point with the next scan line, what happens is, of course, this delta y increases by one and the delta x increases by another value. So I can use this here to calculate the slope also, which gives the same value, 7 half or 3.5. And that, but that also means that each time I move along the line by one step in the y direction, I move on the x direction by 2 seventh. Because if delta y equals 1, then this equation here, of course, is 1 divided by delta x is 7 half. And that, of course, leads to this uh, delta x. And that means we have here a step width about which we have to increase the delta x. So we don't have to calculate this intersection point. If we know the start here, we just have to once calculate the deltas and then we ha just have to add them up. So instead of here this, uh, this division that we need for calculating the intersection points, we just need to add two values, which is of course much nicer. Yeah, so yeah, so this is then the, the, the full illustration of it. We know at the beginning, of course, we start at the lower end of the, the, the lower vertex of this uh, line segment, and which is at 1, 1, and then of course, for each scan line, when we move with the scan line up, we always increase it by one. So this is this plus delta y, which in that case is always one. And the delta x is always two seventh. So here we make plus two seventh in each step. And that way, by just adding these deltas, we can calculate, of course, all intersection points here. The same for the other lines. And, oh, uh, no, that was wrong. That was exactly not what you're doing. Because that's uh, the thing with, it's sometimes a little confusing because usually you take the delta x as one because then the, the delta y is exactly your slope. And here we're just doing it the other way around. We take the delta y as one and that way we get the step width from if we're moving up in the y direction. So if you make a one step here, then of course you make a delta, the delta step goes to here for this line here. Good, yeah. Yeah, so you see this is really simple, but of course the question is uh, how can we phrase this in an algorithm? And for uh, to implement this, we are using usually two data structures, two tables, and one is the edge table that represents the original representation of the polygon or the original uh, data of the polygon, and then a so-called active edge table, which is then modified a modified version of the edge table in each step where we can then easily see the uh, intersection points so the edge table is defined as um, we have entries in the edge table for each scan line where a new polygon starts so for example at position one of the scan line we see there are two polygons starting the one I, uh, uh, here at the bottom where I, I have the first entry and then the other one the, the more flatter one which is the second entry and the edge table now contains the index of the scan line indicated by one here so that is the index of the scan line it also contains the end of the edge the y value of the end of the edge, which is 8 in this case, it contains the x value, which is this one here, the blue one, and it contains the slope. And now we see if we have the slope and the starting point, we can calculate each intersection point here by just adding the delta x. And because we know where the maximum y value is of this edge uh, of this uh, yeah this edge of the ver of the polygon we also know when we have to stop because when we have added it here seven times then the y value we're at the y value 8 
and that is the end of the poly of the edge, so we know we have to stop here. And uh, yeah, so this is very simple. The reason why I'm making it so, in such a detail here is that I often realize in, in exams that people make just very stupid mit mistakes. So for example, they, they forget when they're supposed to write down the edge table or one entry of the edge table, they forget to write down this first index here of the scan line, which kind of indicates that I mean, first of all, you can just forget about it uh, and when, you're, when you're writing it out in the exam. And that's, just, of course, annoying when you, are, when you know it and you just get, don't get the credit for it because you're just sloppy. But in a lot of times, it's just an indication that people are just trying to memorize the algorithm but are not really trying to understand it. And of course, if you, because, of course, if you don't have the index there, you're not able to reconstruct the edge of the polygon. So you always have to think about, I'm making a table that represents the, the polygon, so do I have all the information there to represent the call it polygon? And if you don't write that down, it's an indication that you didn't really understand it or try to understand it, you just tried to memorize it. And that's a general thing that I want to, to highlight a little bit uh, also with, the, with respect to the exams. Um, because there, there are, of course, especially in the second part, there are much more algorithms where you can just try to memorize them and then you get, uh, uh, at least in those uh, exercises in the exam where you just have to execute an algorithm, you, you, get, uh, you can get for full credit even without really understanding it. But the problem is, like already last time, uh, uh, some people were saying, well, there's, there is so much material in this course. Well, how, how can we all remember this? How can we all memorize that? And uh, of course, I'm aware of this. I warned you about this at the very beginning. But the point is, if you're just trying to memorize it without understanding, you will have definitely problems unless you have a very, very good memory because it's just too much material. But if you're trying to really understand why are we doing this? Why are, do we need, for example, a normal vector for the implicit representation? Or why do we need two uh, direction vectors for the parametric equation? Or how is the parametric equation, uh, uh, how do we calculate the point with that? Then it's much easier, of course, to also remember the formulas. And that's also why I'm sometimes doing the stuff here very detailed to explain you the idea behind it and not just the single steps that you're doing because for this algorithm it's really extremely simple so I'm already wasting a lot of time with this but uh, hopefully I, I think you, you understand that this is uh, important to really understand how it works and why it works and not just um, not just memorize it. Good, yeah, so we have the, this way we present the, the, the edge table, the first edge. For the second, of course, we don't have to write it here uh, because we already have it, but of course, we already also need here the, the index. Then on the second scan line, we see another edge starts and then another one start to start at the fourth scan line, but in between there are no edges starting. So this is our edge table and this represents our whole polygon in a way, of course, that makes it now very easily to do this scan line procedure and to extract those points that we really need for the drawing. And this is done by the so-called active edge table which is then a modification of the, uh, just a development of the original edge table. What we say is what we do here, when we move up with the edge table, we also record all the entries from the, uh, from the original edge table, but we modify then the entries in a way that we basically change it that we don't have the original starting points here, but we are moving basically the intersection point up. And then when we see that we are at the end of it, then we remove it from the edge table because we are at the end of the vertex. So let's go through an example here which uh, illustrates it. So we move to the next one, and then we add the delta x y value to the x value. So we, s oops, sorry. Why, is there anything wrong here or it's the, the noise level is kind of increasing? If, the, if I'm, if I'm too slow or too fast, or if something is wrong here, always let me know. If you're just bored, then just lower your voice a little bit. Good, all right. Um, yeah, because this is something when I write something down, it's also very easy to get uh, distracted. That's why I'm, um, I'm wondering a little. Good, yeah, so let's go through this algorithm. So we start with the edge table at the first entry. Of course, there we just have one point. And then we move to the next one. So we say we want to represent these intersection points here now that we have here. And those are, of course, like we said, we just need when we move, when we add delta, increase delta by one, we just need to increase, uh, no, when we increase the y value just by this delta y 
equals 1, so we just add 1 to the y value, then we need to add this delta x that we calculated to the x value. So we take this x here, delta x, and add it to the original x value. So at the scan line number two, or scan line number 1, of course, let's uh, repeat that. We have 1, 8, 2, 7, and 1, 2, 8. Now I wrote it in a really bad way, so this is the scan line, and this here is the edge record that we have. Good, and now we're moving up to the next scan line, number two, and that means, of course, the, y, the end value doesn't change, of course, the delta x also doesn't change, but if this now should represent the intersection point, then, of course, the y value changes by one, which is represented by the scan line, and the x value changes by Two seventh, so we have here one two seventh, and for the second edge we have nine because the delta x is eight. One plus eight is nine. The other two values, of course, stay the same. And we see here a third edge starts here from our edge table. We see that not from here, from the edge table. So we have here nine six and minus one half. Now. Uh, we see here that for the second one, no, first of all, we see here that we have here an x value of 1 to 7th and an x value of 9, which is larger than 1 to 7th. So we know here that these two are the borders of our polygon. And this one also starts at 9, so we know that there is no not more coming, but it, it starts here. Uh, of course, there could be more coming in this case, for example, but uh, uh, here we just have these three, so we have these two, these x values, so we know, of course, that these are the ones that we have to draw. So these are the pixels that we have to draw. And the other thing we see here is that here, the y value and the scan line value are the same. And the scan line value represents the y value of this intersection point. So we see that the intersection point is already the end of this edge here. So in the next step, we remove this edge here, uh, this entry here. So in the third scan line, we again add this here. So we have 2, 4, 7. We have 8 and 2, 7 here. And then we have here. We reduce this because it's a, a negative slope here. So we have 8, 1 half, 6, and minus 1 half. And that one disappeared because we were at the end of the edge. So we know we're we drawing these points in here between. And then we continue like this. And like I said, uh, here, of course, we have a little a different situation because we then have get new edge entries here. So here we have 3, but because we have this one twice, we see that here another part of the polygon starts, and here then, of course, we have then four, uh, two segments, which we can see if we are sorting, of course, our edge record by the x value, which is uh, not listed here, but it's listed here. Here it is listed, sort by the x value. Yeah, so this is just the summary of the algorithm. Good, yeah. So you see, it's uh, it's very simple, but I wanted to make it in detail because these are really when we ha I'm always uh, annoyed when we have these very simple exercises in the exam and then it goes wrong because people are just making really stupid mistakes and you see really they looked into it and they learned it, but we cannot really give them the full credit because they are not accurate enough and make stupid mistakes. Good, yeah. So this is the whole uh, the whole algorithm. Of course, uh, I don't think I have to go through the whole thing. I made it already in quite detail. Yeah, so you see here with this scanline approach, we can very easily decide which, uh, which, uh, uh, which pixel we want to put the color on, but we can also use the scanline approach for another, uh, or the, the concept of a scanline approach for other, other things. And one of them is this uh, 
set, uh, we can use it in a set buffering. So last time I said a little sloppy that um, we're just projecting the, the vertices of the triangle and keep the set value. And then uh, for the set values in between, we can interpolate between the set values, which is of course true. And we know how to do interpolation, but of course we also want to do interpolation efficiently. And of course you can guess it, we can do this efficiently with the set, uh, uh, with the scanline algorithm uh, modification of it at uh, basically the same the same idea when we have a triangle with x y x and y values we increase the y values by one in each step and then we get the related x value to know which are the intersection points here and then, then we can draw everything in between but we can also instead of increasing the x value here we can calculate the delta between the set zero and the set one. And then of course we also have to use the y one and the y zero here. And then we get a delta set or a slope set, a slope that we had if this set would be a point here. It's of course not a point, it's a point in the a coordinate in the dimension that we eliminated by the projection, but we can calculate this step width that if we constantly add it, to this original value here, we will end up at the other value and then have a linear increase in the value over the whole uh, sequence of steps. And this is of course exactly what we want for the set buffer. We want to have the values in between linearly interpolated. So the trick is here, or the only difficult thing here is to really look into the slope where we have to put the set values here. And of course, because like I said, usually we're looking at what happens to the y value when we increase x by one when we deal with the slope intercept form. But of course here we are looking for the y value to increase by one, which means of course we have to replace the x with the set value here. And then the set value, uh, we can uh, calculate this delta set. Good. Yeah, in relation to that, some other uh, comments to the set buffering. I made it very short last time because, of course, there is not really much to the set buffering because it's really just a simple, very simple and straightforward approach. But, of course, there are also, uh, uh, all simplicity usually comes at a price. There are, of course, some issues with it. One of them is, of course, if you do it, especially when you do it in software, there are large memory requirements. Um, it is not always the case that uh, single, individual pink, uh, pixels, uh, when they have, um, like, because you're constantly overdrawing stuff, it could, or it could, you could end up constantly overdrawing a lot of stuff, and that can of course be a problem if this drawing of one pixel is expensive. And uh, the other thing is, of course, because it works with this overdrawing per default, it doesn't really support transparency but uh, because you're basically just overdrawing something when it's closer and then you throw the rest away. So there are of course modifications that also deal with transparency, but per default the approach basically uh, assumes like the, the painter algorithm that you constantly draw stuff over each other and uh, throw the other stuff away. And then of course um, you, uh, you have a problem with transparency. Good. All right, so much about the uh, set buffering. Now, uh, Another situation where we used the linear interpolation with triangles so far was of course for the actual color because now we know of course how we can put, no, we know which pixels where we can put the color on, but of course we don't want to have only triangles with the same color, but we want to have triangles with different colors or where the vertices have different colors and we want to interpolate over the surface of the of the triangles with these uh, colors. And we already learned how to do this when we talked about the linear, inter uh, linear interpolation. And this is the slide that I copied from that lecture. And then it said, of course, we will learn this in a later lecture. And that is, of course, this one. And of course, you already guessed it. Uh, the image I made illustrates the basic idea. You go along the edges and interpolate the color, and then you also move between these edges and interpolate the color here. But of course, you can also do it by moving a scan line vertically upwards and then uh, do the interpolation here, do it here and do it here. And of course, you can also do this with this delta x by in the same way as we used 
the set uh, the set values instead of the x values when we use the set buffer in the same way we can of course use any kind of values for example we can use the rgb values of the colors that we have so if we have a color zero here with rgb values and a color one we here with rgb values we can calculate the rgb in the same way as we calculate the set uh, delta set value again you have to be careful where we put the set or where uh, which one uh, value we have to take and um, but other than that it's uh, exactly the same and then we can calculate the, the color values here of course we also have to do this between this point here so you see of course we have to calculate a lot of deltas here but then we just have to add them up so what we have to do is we have for each of the edges we have to do four divisions for the RGB values and also of course for the X value to get the edges in the first place or the points on the edges in the first place and then we have to make three divisions for the deltas for the interpolation in between but that's it everything else is just adding those uh, delta values then to the color values good so you see this should work very fast and very efficient yeah so um, <clears throat> and that brings us or we are already in the uh, uh, the, the chapter about uh, the shading now um, and this uh, kind of shading, this linear shading, is, uh, if you do it in a special way, is usually called the Gouraud shading, which produces this so-called diffuse light, which is, of course, something that you already heard. We called it uh, the Lambertian shading at the beginning, because we already had this in our simplified model. Good, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to basically going through this uh, simplified model again and make some additional comments to it, which is also why it would be a good opportunity for a break. So let's make a break now and then meet, yeah, let's say in f yeah, 15 minutes.